Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Chair, for the opportunity to address this audience and thank you for you guys for showing up. Um, you might have seen that I was cautiously optimistic on the boat, um, but just for the record, I work across all the energy sectors um, and I understand what all these technologies can do and what they cannot do. So I'm not here to discredit or make less of any technology in the industry but rather to level the playing fields for the nuclear industry, which has recently been skewed by some of the media that we've seen in the past. Um, just kind of considering the landscape that you see behind you of the energy sector, um, you know, South Africa has a very proud um, power generation heritage. Um, back in 1882, we had our first centralized power station in Kimberley, which uh, lit up the streets of, of the city. Um, and this is way before New York. That was a massive accomplishment. Um, in the 50s, we had a big build of um, about eight power stations were built in eight years, and that was really driving the backbone of the mining industry in this country. In the last few decades of the 20th century, we had an unprecedented build of power generation capacity, including nuclear energy, which today drives our economy. Just Okay, um, looking further down on the page, you'll see what we're currently doing. Today we're building some of the most sophisticated power plants, coal plant power plants in the world. Um, and uh, yes, these are um, problematic, um, but it's a symptom of what happens when you lose the impetus that you once had. Um, we also are building a fantastic um, renewable energy program in South Africa, which has attracted the attention of the world, and it's certainly for once has opened up the market for the private sector to invest in it. And this may well be a good option for the nuclear energy industry coming in the future. Um, at this point, one gets to uh, a stage where you can now um, contemplate the future of this country's energy sector. Um, and we're looking at this, and this is something that we need to plan, especially for the long term. We cannot make short term decisions anymore, we've done that. And we are, we are because of that. We now need to make long-term decisions. And that's where we feel that nuclear energy definitely has a role to play. What I'm going to talk to you about today is why does nuclear energy make sense for South Africa? The key drivers behind the economics of nuclear energy. Why nuclear safety is an overriding priority. I think Felicia did talk quite a bit about that. And building a real knowledge economy in South Africa. Alright, generally I find that what people resist about the nuclear industry is what it isn't. If it was that, I wouldn't be in it, and nor would my company be in it. So, I think it's quite a good opportunity to demystify this industry and to try and have a bit of understanding of it and appreciation for it. So looking at the sense of uh, the energy for South Africa, I want to talk firstly about what um, nuclear energy is. It's not a bomb. Okay. This is what a typical configuration of a nuclear power plant looks like. It's a Westinghouse design. And essentially in the middle you have the nuclear reactor which is filled with fuel. Um, it is a low enrichment fuel. And this is stimulated and it creates a fission process which releases heat. That heat is extracted through the primary circuit and those green pumps that you see in the middle um, at a temperature of about 500 degrees centigrade and sent to the steam generators through a heat exchanger which is similar to the electric element in your kettle. On a separate and independent circuit, water comes into the steam generator, flashes across the um, heat exchangers and creates steam. And the steam goes into a header which goes to these turbines which is typical of what we see on coal-fired power plants. This is a known technology in South Africa. The unknown part of South Africa from a construction and engineering perspective is really the nuclear side of the business here. South Africa has a commitment, it's made a commitment um, to um, reduce its carbon emissions. And one of the big contributors to that is nuclear energy, which is clean base load power. It is really having a major impact on that area. And some of the indications that we've seen earlier would show uh, the impact this has. 
It also offers fuel security. South Africa has the seventh biggest uh, uranium reserves in the world. You can also store a decade's worth of fuel on site, which really makes you immune to mining strikes or the rain that keeps on wetting our coal. It does offer a lot of fuel security for this, this country, which is what we desperately need. Our grid is also capable of accommodating large blocked power plants. Because we have 40 gigawatts on our grid, um, it is a factor of what you can put onto your grid as far as a single unit is concerned. Um, this is very unique for the rest of Africa, where the grid capacities are very small, and they cannot afford to put a big block on it. Big blocks come with economies of scale, which is something that we can benefit from. Something we also need to understand, looking ahead, is that our base load supply capacity is currently under pressure, which I think we all agree. With, in the medium term, there is some relief. The Dupi and Busiri are going to put a number of gigawatts in the grid every year, and it could create some relief for the country. But as GDP catches up and slow, we're going to quickly absorb that. But we also need to understand that the assets that we have today are aging, and we're going to look at resign or retiring these assets um, from about 2025 to 2035 to the tune of about 20 gigawatts of energy. We need to start building that today to make sure that we don't put this country into a crisis. And there's a lot of arguments about when that day of decommissioning is going to happen, but looking at the reliability of the equipment today, um, the condition of the equipment, and how hard it is working, I think those numbers are looking quite realistic. South Africa also has an established nuclear industry. It has world-class education facilities that teaches nuclear engineering, nuclear physics to some of the highest standards in the world. We have an industry, we may as well use it. We've invested a lot in it. There are a lot of people, young students that are investing into this. Let us use this capability and capacity that we have. I'm not sure I got to this one. Okay. Coming back to the economics, um, this is a bit of a detailed slide, so I'm going to talk you carefully through it. Um, essentially, one does need to look at the nuclear energy profile. It has a unique profile which is different to a lot of other technologies. Yes, it has a very high overnight capital cost. It is twice as expensive as coal. That is a fact. It, however, has a low operating cost. Fuel cost, in your levelized cost of electricity, is only 6%. What does that mean? If you look at gas turbines, the fuel cost is 70%. So if you have volatility in your fuel cost, it will not affect the price of nuclear energy. That's why I can give you a tariff for nuclear energy for the next 35 years. You have a small incremental increase on gas or energy for fuels, your electricity cost is going to double. So that is the risk that we need to um, look at addressing with nuclear energy. Nuclear energy also has a 60 to 80 year economic life cycle. This is three times of a renewable energy plant. You have to recapitalize a renewable energy plant three times in the life of a nuclear plant. So if you want to start talking about the capital costs alone, we've already dismissed that in this alone. It also provides zero emissions and 90% capacity factor, which is also three times your average for renewable energy. These are key factors that make nuclear competitive and affordable. It, the new generation technologies, the uh, integrated control systems that we're looking at on these plants are starting to bring these technologies to be able to follow the load of the grid where typically they were static, base load, don't want to move. Today we can start seeing these plants following the loads um, that we have capabilities in our coal-fired power plants. Google today produces the cheapest power on the grid. I'm open to any form of comment. I think, uh, Kravir, if you could just comment on that. Um, and this, these are some things that we have to look at. This is what you get when you have a long-term view um, of the energy sector. The short-term view would never make sense for nuclear. The drivers behind our capex in nuclear energy are the following. <coughs> nuclear safety features. All right? Now, a 747 crashing into a stadium at a World Cup game, it's unthinkable. Alright? 
But do we go and build a containment building around our stadiums in the event of that happening? No. We take that risk. The nuclear industry doesn't. It builds an aircraft crash detection system, a shell around it that can take any form of terrorist attack or aircraft that are crashing into that building. That's what we do. We build in the safety. Fukushima has brought in a whole lot of safety features. A lot of them are passive, some of them are active. But we are striving to make our plants safer and safer, but it does affect the capital costs of these projects. Industry standards are also very high. I run an organization that meets these standards. And it's a very costly exercise if you compare what we do for the rest of the group in the conventional uh, energy sectors. Rating of, of return on um, capital intensive businesses is a very big influence. Um, government can actually look at a lot of this through its uh, state owned enterprises like Nexa and Danel. Um, these may be investments that these organizations could incur to help some of these cost incentives. The economics of scale has not yet been realized on Generation 3 technology. Not enough of them have been built. But that is today. What are we looking at in South Africa is probably um, when we do get to build our plants, you probably find these economies of scale that come together with the number of plants that we build. We would typically build the um, units number 10, which is an end unit. A lot of the risks that you're seeing on the first of the kind in Finland, in Finland um, and all over, over the world, a lot of those risks will be realized, the lessons learned, the economies of scale, a lot of that will be realized. Uh, and we may not see the challenges we see in the market today. How to unlock competitiveness on, of nuclear energy is, we've got to look at that. Uh, what Dirk was saying is really looking at the levelized cost of electricity. And that is a function of capex, opex, and weighted average cost of capital. And that's people's re return on investment. Weighted, what I've highlighted weighted uh, cost of capital because it is the biggest influence on whether you make nuclear viable or not. One or two percentage points will switch it on or switch it off. It's as simple as that. Only because it is capital intensive. That doesn't really um, affect low capital intensive um, technologies like renewable energies. But that's something that government can uh, deal with. If you put in all the hidden costs and the external costs of uh, these technologies, and by hidden costs, I'm talking about the gas turbines, the very gas, expensive gas turbines that need to be dispatched when renewable energies go off the grid at night or when the wind stops. That is very expensive electricity, it's unaffordable. But the, the, that is not something that we talk about about that. That is something that's never really mentioned. But we need to actually take that into effect. And if you do take that into consideration, um, you would probably find um, Treasury's um, capital costs of 8.4% uh, would make me a competitor with coal. If you look at nurses' recommendations of 5.1%, it will be a hell of a lot more uh, cost effective than coal. So it's about that figure, and if you want to play around with it, you play with that, and that's the government's ability to manipulate those figures. We also need to procure proven technologies. And a, prey and, a, and a proven safety authority. These are the, the industries that come together um, from wherever they are in the world, there's five of them, and they provide the full panorama of the not only technology, but the safety authority, the design authorities that goes with it, the funding, the bilateral agreements. Remember, the decision we make today is the decision we live with for the next hundred years. Until these plants are decommissioned, the management of all the fuel, the waste, everything is going to be done for the full cycle. So it's a very important decision to make. Two minutes. Locating these plants um, in uh, energy stranded regions like the Eastern Cape is of great help to South Africa. It opens up new economies and it does help pursue to reduce our massive transmission losses. I think we're sitting at about 11 percent transmission loss in South Africa. That is, that is serious rands um, on our economy at the moment. Okay, I'm hopelessly the last one, this one, on time. So, just a little bit on nuclear safety. I think um, Lisa did talk about that. This is a typical nuclear plant. This is what Cuba looks like. Um, three points of it is a nuclear island, a conventional island where the turbines and generators sit. I don't want to get into a technical dissertation now. 
and the balance of crime, these are the supporting infrastructures, including cooling that cools the plants down. The bit that is important is the nuclear island, and this is something that is new for us, and this is something that our industry needs to develop on. The stuff on the right is what we do already on Facilia and to build. The bit on the left really needs an independent nuclear regulator, the requirements that come with it that help support the local nuclear regulator um, in, in making these projects a reality. Um, there are a lot of relationships that need to be put in, a lot of industry codes that need to be put in, and safety cultures, which I'll talk about later. So, why is nuclear safety an overriding priority? So, what is nuclear safety, by the way? It's really the prevention of undue radiation hazards to the environment and people. So, we've got to protect that. And that is the guiding principle of this industry. So, everything you do, every management system you do, every bit of training you do, is to actually uphold that. Nuclear safety is an uncompromising gatekeeper to this industry and is maintained by our national nuclear regulator as the overarching safety authority. It is a very regulated industry. The sustainability of nuclear safety is only possible with nuclear safety culture. Now, a safety culture that you may be aware of and take a lot for granted is the aviation culture. And that is really when you get on the plane, you take it for granted, you're going to get to the other side. And guess what you do? And it's only because of the safety cultures that are put into these industries, the technology, the aviation standards and regulations, the safe airports and air traffic control, a um, little video that pops down and you have to look down every, every time. That is a safety culture. But what it does is it really lessens the accident rate. And it's taken it from 50 before the safety culture was uh, introduced, from 50 accidents per million flights down to 2.2. Okay, and it's now getting half to 1.1 because of digital control systems and aviation and autopilots. So we're seeing a massive reduction on that again by half. Please wrap up. Okay. I just want to look at um, the knowledge economy that I spoke about. This is the wrap up of my presentation. This is what we do currently in the top at Gusile. Uh, um, two units equivalent to 1650 megawatts. There's a lot of stress that's going into these projects, but there's a lot of good things. There's a lot of things we're doing right, but you only hear about the things we're doing wrong. And that is kind of normal. Um, below you see the equivalent in power generation of nuclear. Um, what you find is the top there is really the intensity of construction. You're looking at 100,000 tons of, 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 of structural steel versus probably five to 10,000 tons of structural steel at the bottom. The stuff in the bottom from the nuclear sector comes shipped into this country. It takes a lot of the stress out of what we're experiencing on the build today. So technology speaking, it's probably an easier build than it is to build a coal fire plant in South Africa today. Um, unfortunately, we've got our timing wrong, we've lost the opportunity. Um, we're demobilizing the civil works on these plants today and we're nowhere near starting a new build program for South Africa in nuclear. We, we would have taken those what very well qualified resources, which has cost us a lot of money, and mobilized them onto the construction site. It's a bit unfortunate that we may be losing that opportunity and those wonderful resources that we've created. Um, how far reaching is our green economy? Um, it's very quick and, and, and smart, but so are the jobs that it offers. The guys come in, two years later they're out. Um, these, pro these projects don't create um, a lot of long-lasting jobs. Maybe the CSP industry in the bottom left-hand corner may do a better job when it does come to the market, uh, but right now we're not seeing it. Short-term job creation versus what we're looking at is long-term career creation. If you build two of these babies, you're probably sitting with a lot more career opportunities in South Africa. And every industry needs a, a game-changer, so let me give the new industry a game-changer, and that would be the jobs and real careers and long-term careers that it creates. Thank you very much.